Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Archaeology Hour, sponsored by the AIA. My name is John Newell. I'm the president of the Pittsburgh chapter of the AIA. The Pittsburgh chapter focuses mainly on the Greco-Roman world and has a close affiliation with the Department of Classics at the University of Pittsburgh. If you live in the area and have an interest in archaeology, uh, you can join us and get on our mailing list by joining the AIA and affiliating with us. The AIA, as the slide show, is North America's oldest and largest archaeological organization. It's an organization for professionals as well as for those with an interest in archaeology. Uh, this interest is reflected in our two publications, the American Journal of Archaeology, which publishes scholarly findings, and Archaeology Magazine, which provides a popular presentation of much the same material. Members of the AIA can get professionally involved in excavations or participate in educational programs or even mix it up with some travel with tours led by archaeologists who can sometimes take you behind the scenes or let you know what all the uh, digging is about. Uh, so yes, you can uh, join the AIA. Here's a QR code to scan, but you can always go to the website, archaeological.org, and you can either type in the join or find a, a button uh, there that will uh, enable you to join. Uh, here again are some of the benefits. You see mentioned here uh, the annual meeting. Uh, that's a great place to encounter talks like this from all over the world and a place to meet archaeologists in person. Uh, as a nonprofit educational institution, we do need some money to keep things going. So if you are in position to uh, help keep moving things forward, let me encourage you to put a little fuel in our tank. Today's free lecture is made possible by past donations. So pay it forward. Uh, here's a lineup for uh, upcoming Archaeology Hour talks. Uh, this is just a small a segment of the programming AIA uh, has to offer. Uh, Dr. Caldwell's lecture in September is past, but you can find it on YouTube archaeology uh, channel, and so uh, it's not, not lost. Uh, Saturday is Archaeology Day. So check out the AIA website for a variety of activities. Um, here in Pittsburgh, we're getting a jump start on the day uh, with tonight's talk. Um, uh, and well, yes, uh, please refrain from recording the talk. It will be posted on YouTube, so there's really no need to bother with uh, making a recording anyway. Um, the next talk in the series will be on November 13th when Dr. Futrell gives us some insights into uh, what it's like to be in the Coliseum uh, as part of the audience, I think. Uh, and uh, that, of course, brings us to this evening's lecture. Um, today, I am greeting you from the 15th floor of the University of Pittsburgh's Cathedral of Learning, a 40-story Gothic-style skyscraper, which houses, among other things, about 30 nationality rooms, which are classrooms which double as uh, time capsules, each presenting what a classroom would look like in a given country or region about 200 years ago. This semester, I happen to be teaching a course on Augustus, in the African room, uh, so it's really quite fitting. Now Augustus, uh, like Anthony and Julius Caesar before him, knew the value of Egypt, uh, so much so that he forbade anybody who was anybody uh, from going there without his written permission. Exploring southward along the Nile, the Romans came upon a, the various cataracts of the Nile. Those are rocky shallows that sometimes run like rapids, and which apparently served as an effective boundary between Egypt and the kingdoms of the south. They knew of Meroi and, in typical Roman fashion, got into a bit of a tussle with them. The Romans, of course, uh, like to cast this as the victory, but that doesn't account for the un-Roman failure to incorporate Meroi into the empire, nor does it account for the head of Augustus, violently severed from a bronze statue and symbolically buried in Meroi at the foot of a shrine to victory. Six Semper Tyrannus, I suppose one might say. The Romans, for their part, conducted a different kind of burial, that of ignoring Meroi in their histories and consigning it to oblivion, or almost. For archaeologists are on the case, 
And today we get to hear from one of them, Dr. Solange Ashby, Assistant Professor at UCLA's Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures, who has firsthand knowledge of the clues the people of Moroe left behind. Dr. Moroe holds a PhD in Egyptology from the University of Chicago and specializes in ancient languages, including the language of Moroe and both the hieroglyphics and demotic of Egypt. In addition to bringing this neglected past to light, Dr. Ashby also endeavors to bring light to people of African descent through the William Leo Hansberry Society, which aims to help them navigate contemporary efforts at consigning certain things to oblivion. So way to go on doing that. Uh, today's lecture is sure to whet your appetite for more, so make a note of this. Dr. Ashby has a book out entitled Calling Out to Isis, which looks at Nubian worship of Isis. She'll also be giving a talk in April for the Walla Walla Society on Cleopatra and the Queens of Moroni. So put that on your calendar. For the detail, look up events on archaeological.org when you join. But now, without further ado, uh, please welcome our speaker, Dr. Solange Aspi, and bear with us for a moment as we sort out the technicalities of changing our screens. And oh, uh, after the talk, we'll have some time for questions. If something occurs to you as a question, put it in the special Q&A box that you'll see. Uh, the chat will just use for uh, greetings and, and what other things, but questions put in the Q&A box. So now I hand it over to our speaker. Uh, Dr. All right, uh, thank you for um, that warm introduction, John. Um, and thank you to the AIA for inviting me to um, give this month's Archaeology Hour lecture. I'm really happy to um, tell you some more about this ancient civilization. So as promised, I will be talking to you about um, four or five queens uh, from ancient Africa, more specifically um, from the kingdom of Meroe. Um, I'd like to start with this image, which has nothing to do with uh, ancient Meroe, um, because as you'll see when we progress through these slides, these queens are in many ways understood as divine. They are often present themselves with breast bared, which I understand as a power move and an allusion to their um, uh, fertility, ability to bring forth life. Um, and so I like to use this image um, from the Afro-Cuban American painter, Armonia Rosales. Before I launch into the um, gist of my talk, I would like to acknowledge an uh, intellectual ancestor. Uh, William Sanders Scarborough was an early African-American classicist. Uh, in, in fact, the first African-American to um, publish a Greek uh, grammar which he did in the late 19th century, just a decade and a half after the end of chattel slavery in the United States. Um, I mention him because he was a lifelong member of the American Philological Association, uh, which later became um, the Society for Classical Studies. Um, which has been holding joint annual conferences with AIA since 1898. Um, and so Scarborough definitely um, presented at many annual conferences, um, and he is um, just well known for uh, his uh, early involvement in this field. I did want to note uh, that he, in fact, was even invited to visit the White House uh, by President Teddy Roosevelt uh, and in 1907 went there with a delegation of APA and AIA members after the annual um, conference that year in Washington, D.C. You can learn a bit more um, about Mr. Scarborough by this uh, 2005 biography written by Michelle Ronick, 
Um, it's a good read. Um, and, and she delves into much more of his history than I can present here. Okay, to our uh, matter at hand. I am starting here with a list of uh, five Meroitic queens. Um, you can see their names listed here on the left. Uh, Nahirko is uh, the earliest of these queens. She's a bit of an outlier. She rules 120 years uh, before her successor queens, um, but they're mostly um, tightly packed in this 100 year period from about 50 BCE to about 50 CE. These queens, uh, sole ruling queens held uh, two titles, very important titles in the Meroitic kingdom. The most important being Kor, um, that designates the ruler in the language of Meroe, which doesn't uh, gender words. And so Kor can be used for a male ruler or a female ruler. Um, and the second title is Kandake, which we're still working to a precise translation, but it seems to indicate the queen mother, the woman who gives birth to children who... Um, can legitimately be considered to um, rule the kingdom of Meroe. I'm using this image on the right uh, of uh, Queen Amani Tore, the last queen that we will look at, um, as depicted on the side of a bark stand, uh, which is a big block of stone on which a sacred ceremonial bark would have been uh, rested as it arrived at a temple, in this case, a temple at Wad Ban Naka near Meroe, and I'll show you that on a map later. This bark stand is kind of famous because it is the text written in both Meroitic and Egyptian hieroglyphs that allowed the British Egyptologist Francis Griffith to decipher um, the Meroitic script. And so this bark stand has images on all four sides, two of which show Queen Amani Tore, and she has her arms upraised, literally upholding the sky. I hope you can see the stars above her head. She again is bare-breasted, um, and she is very much um, uh, worshiping, revering the god Amun, whose bark would have sat on top of this bark stand. So a bit more, let's talk a bit more about this uh, term kandake. There are three of these queens that I'm presenting who held this title, and we know that from um, texts that are preserved on their monuments. So Amani Reynas, Amani Shaketo, and Amani Tore all held this title kandake as queen mother. And on the right here, we can see an image again of Amani Tore on the right being embraced by the ram headed god Amun. Um, this ram headed manifestation is very specifically Nubian. The same god is worshipped in Egypt, but he's presented in a human form. This is part of the royal birth narrative um, of the queen mother coming together with this um, supreme god Amun to create um, the next heir to the throne. So that is what is kind of subtly and tastefully depicted here. And you will see again uh, that Amani Tore is um, bare chested in this depiction. And perhaps you can also see in her left hand, she's holding the Egyptian Ankh sign, which is promising the life that um, is about to be conceived here. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, you can see um, a sample of uh, Meroitic cursive writing. It's read from right to left, like Hebrew or Arabic um, or the earlier Egyptian scripts. Um, and so it's an, basically an alphabet, an alpha syllabary. So this letter that looks like a three with a tail writes ka, di, ka. And then this is an E at the end to write kandake. And the N is not actually written, but just 
um, understood and preserved in the Greek translation of this word. Great. So when did the kingdom of Meroe exist? It uh, lasts for about 600 years and is contemporary, as John mentioned in the intro, um, with both uh, Ptolemaic Greek rule in Egypt and Roman rule that followed that. So the Ptolemies are descended from that general of Alexander of Macedon, and they all had the name Ptolemy, Berenike, or Cleopatra, the most famous of whom uh, died in 30 BCE as uh, the Roman emperor Octavian arrived uh, to conquer Egypt. Uh, and, and then we have Roman rule in Egypt for another approximately 300 years. So all the while that Egypt is being colonized first by Greeks and then by Romans, we have this kingdom of Meroe existing just south uh, of Egypt's southern border. So as to where is uh, Nubia exactly located, I like to use these two maps side by side. I'll use the one on the left to talk about the geographic designation Nubia, and then the one on the right to point to um, the political formations that arose in this land. Um, so to start on the left, you see that small inset. I like to always emphasize that this Nile Valley watershed is uh, on the African continent, Northeast Africa. Um, and then you can see that the land of ancient Nubia is um, divided between the modern nation of Egypt and the modern nation of Sudan. Um, Nubia is the land uh, between the cataracts and so its Northern border is at Aswan. Um, at the first cataract, it's also the site of uh, a temple called Philae, and its southern border is at the sixth cataract. So all of the cataracts along the Nile are located within the land of Nubia. Um, and so I'll just show you an image of what a cataract looks like. This I took from a boat at the sixth cataract located in Sudan. And you can see, you can't see the rock formations in the riverbed, but you can see the rapids that are formed by those that make um, boat travel on the river impossible. So this becomes a good uh, geographic marker and also a place where markets, uh, forts, uh, fortresses and uh, taxation can happen because all boats going uh, down the Nile, so north into Egypt, had to unload their goods and be carried around the rapids in order to proceed down the Nile. So now moving to the map on the right, we can see the political formations that arose in Nubia. Um, and you can see that they're happening over a 3,000 year period um, with the earliest capital city and kingdom located at Kerma at the third cataract, which is then followed by Napata, um, out of which arose um, the kings who would move north into Egypt and rule there as Egypt's 25th dynasty, the Kushite pharaohs. But then to our period that we'll focus on today, um, Meroe is located here um, just south of the Sixth Cataract. And just a bit of context in which to understand these amazing queens that we will look at. So now time for true confessions. Um, Meroitic royal chronology is... Um, still a bit piecemeal and um, uh, debated. It changes with uh, every new find. Um, so you'll see these really kind of vague dates for the queens that I'm talking about. And I'm adding here sort of arbitrarily um, picked dates from that the larger range. So maybe it's easier to uh, visual, visualize the progression of these uh, queens. So as I mentioned, Nahirko is the outlier. She precedes this cluster of sole ruling queens by about 120 years. She really sets the stage then for um, these uh, following queens to come to power um, and legitimately rule as sole rulers. 
She's followed by an unnamed queen, but we have a beautiful object from her funerary monument that I would like to show you, um, who's dated about 50 BCE. Amani Reynas, I'm putting at around 30 BCE so that we can connect her to um, Caesar Augustus and his um, colonization of Egypt. Um, Amani Reynas is followed by Amani Shaketo, uh, who lives right around the time of the birth of Christ, um, who's then followed by Noidamak and Amani Tore. So we'll start with this plan of uh, the capital city of Meroe. Uh, you can see on the plan that there is a royal city that is surrounded by gates um, to keep this as a, a sacred and safe enclosure for the rulers. I want to point out here on the left, these royal baths, because I'll show you a statue that comes from those baths. Um, but also to see that there are temples then uh, within the, uh, the capital city of Meroe. Most importantly, the temple of Amun, that ram-headed god who is the supreme god for um, all of these kingdoms in Nubia. The temple of Isis, who's my favorite, that's who I wrote uh, my first book on. Here's the lion temple of an indigenous uh, Meroitic god named Apetamak. Um, and then you can see smaller common cemeteries sort of um, around this area. And I just want you to imagine off of this map, so to the east of the royal city, up on a ridge are three um, royal cemeteries, the north uh, cemetery, uh, there is the um, called Begarowia North, the west cemetery, and then the south cemetery. And the north and west cemeteries are up on a ridge facing east so that they can greet the rising uh, sun. And I will show you what that looks like in the funerary monuments. But back to the royal city. Um, oops, let's go here. I want to just call back to that earlier Nepotan period where so much of the culture is really derivative of Egypt. We have the worship, the adoption of the worship of that god Amun, of gods and goddesses like Hathor and Isis and Horus. And here is an example of a beautiful amulet uh, that was found buried with a queen of the 25th dynasty king, uh, Pianchi, um, looking very Egyptian, right? So this is a period when they're using Egyptian script, they're um, worshiping Egyptian gods, and they're using very Egyptian forms. And to contrast that, I'll show you two pieces of jewelry from this Meroitic period where the art and the religion, the script and the language and so much of the royal attire becomes much more indigenous and Meroitic. So on the left, uh, we have an aegis um, attached to a ring of gold um, that has the head of a Meroitic god. He's a hunter god. He's a warrior god named Sebu Mekker. Um, we don't see this god worshipped anywhere in Egypt. The cowrie shells are um, very much a potent symbol throughout the African continent, and they're very important in this Meroitic period. Although we do see um, the Egyptian wadjet eyes, those protective eyes of Horus on either side. And then here on the right, this beautiful earring from the Museum of Fine Arts Boston collection, we see a Meroitic goddess. Um, she is wearing a double crown, which is uh, typical of Egypt, but she has this streamer coming off the back of it, which is very Meroitic. And the fact that she's a winged goddess, they're um, really into uh, winged goddesses, even winged animals uh, in this uh, Nubian kingdom. And I don't know if you can make out, but she is lifting up and presenting her breast. And this is a theme that I'm going to keep harping on. This seems to be very important for powerful women in this kingdom of Meroe. 
But the city is also very um, cosmopolitan and very much connected to the wider ancient world. And so in the royal baths, we find statues like these referred to as a Venus of Meroe, of a nude bathing woman that looks much more Greek um, in its presentation. And so this is a sign of the trade that's going on between Meroe and Greece, Meroe and Rome, and then even up into um, the highlands of Ethiopia. So to this royal cemetery that is located on the ridge to the east of the capital city, I'm just going to focus on this most important cemetery called Begarawiya North, um, where we see in that photo on the left, um, the destroyed pyramid where Queen Nahirko uh, was buried. But I'm pointing out um, this the burial of this very early Seoul ruling queen because it is the only one in this cemetery of about 64 burials that has a double pylon on the front of it. So this is referred to as a funerary chapel. The interior walls are decorated with scenes that I will show you and then fronted by a monumental gate. Every other one, as you can see from the sketch here, has one pylon, but Nahirko uh, is distinguished by having two pylons at the front of her um, royal burial. So here's that uh, image again, or monument, I'll say, from uh, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston of the unnamed queen who is sitting in the center in her um, glorious voluptuousness. Um, she's wearing a lot of the Meroitic royal iconography, including those ball beads around her neck, a cap crown on her head, and two rearing cobras as opposed to the one that we will see on Egyptian uh, pharaohs. Um, on either side of her are goddesses who, um, based on their uh, headdresses, I would say maybe Isis on the right and Hathor on the left, but most importantly on their laps, you see libation vessels that are tipped to the center toward the queen, pouring out an eternal libation for her afterlife. And this queen is buried up at um, that northern city of Napata, uh, where all of the Napatan rulers were buried and some of the Meroitic rulers continued to be buried at this um, northern royal cemetery. So on to Amani Reynas. Um, who I'm calling the warrior queen, because I think there's general scholarly consensus that she is the queen Candace, who is referred to um, in the first century uh, Greek historian Strabo's um, books, uh, specifically this book called the Geographica, where he's describing various areas of the um, Roman Empire in which he lived. This text is written um, probably about 9 BCE. Um, it, so in his book 17, section 154, he's describing an attack um, of the kingdom of Meroe on the Egyptian state that is now under Roman colonial rule. And so I'm showing this map on the left. I will highlight uh, the cities that he's referring to so you can sort of follow along uh, with Strabo's report about this, uh, the aggressions of Queen Candace. So the quote says, but the Ethiopians attacked the Thebaeus uh, and the garrison of the three cohorts at Syene and by an unexpected onset took Syene and Elephantine and Philae and enslaved the inhabitants and also pulled down the statues of Caesar led by the generals of Queen Candace, who was a ruler of the Ethiopians in my time, a masculine sort of woman and blind in one eye. So Strabo is calling himself a contemporary of this queen um, and describing warfare that is happening as John alluded to at the beginning when Rome is trying, attempting to push south into Nubia, but is being successfully repelled um, by these um, Meroitic uh, warriors who in Strabo's 
telling are led by um, their very queen, uh, who he he says in what attempts to be derogatory manner that she's mannish. Uh, <laughs> for a Roman, that just means that she's at the head of troops. Um, but here we see an example, that very uh, statue that John was referring to now held in the British Museum. They love to display this. They don't like to talk too much about the fact that it was taken as booty by um, Meroitic troops attacking Roman Egypt and then buried under the steps of a temple of victory. So there is uh, Octavian, Caesar Augustus, um, recuperated um, from Sudan. <laughs> okay. So here's an image, uh, a painting of the now destroyed interior of that temple of victory. Um, and so this would have been on the east wall, would have been on the right hand side as you entered the temple. And what um, the artist preserved here is a stretch uh, of painting in which we see two enthroned rulers. We might imagine um, Amani Torre and the Takamani. It could have been Amani Reynas and her husband. Um, but the, the cutouts that are now depicted in color at the bottom come from under the feet of the rulers. And this is very typical imagery in ancient Egypt, but also in the kingdom of Meroe, where the defeated enemy is shown under the feet of the ruler. And you can see they're really trying to depict different ethnicities. So different people that they have engaged in battle and uh, dominated. And so this is the de um, decoration and the interior of this Temple of Victory. And um, Augustus's head was buried underneath the steps leading up to this temple so that this warrior queen could trot on his head every time she went up to celebrate victory in her temple. Uh, so I'm showing you a lot of um, sort of extra imagery about Imana Reynas because unfortunately we do not have a surviving depiction of this warrior queen herself. She's described in Strabo um, that painting from the Temple of Victory may allude to her, although the rulers are only um, um, preserved from the waist down. But here is an actual inscription. I'm sorry, it's a very bad image, but here is um, a cartouche, which is the Egyptian form that should surround the royal name, um, topped by two tall feathers. And inside the cartouche is a long text written in the Amer uh, Meroitic cursive script. And it names Imani Reynas, and she's called Kandake, but before her is her husband's name, Tariticus, and he has the title Kor. Um, and then after the queen is named Akinidad, who has the title Pakara. And so this is sort of the royal trio who together is uh, ruling Meroe. Um, and this inscription is to be found on the front of the pylon at this temple of Dhaka, which, while it is located in northern Nubia, is extremely close to the official southern border of Egypt at the first cataract. So these Meroitic royals are coming up um, with their military, and by leaving this royal inscription at the front of the temple, claiming ownership of this area, if you will. All right, so moving on to Amani Shaketo, who also presents herself very much as a militaristic warrior queen. This um, drawing comes from an image from the front of her pylon on her funerary monument uh, at Meroe. Uh, and you can see the big voluptuous queen with this is how they present themselves and perhaps I believe how they actually looked. And she's grasping defeated enemies who are bound with their elbows and she's about to dispatch them uh, with a spear. 
That image uh, to the right is just showing you a close up of the actual stone carved image of the queen. You can see she's wearing her hair in a short natural afro. Her crown is a, um, a falcon that has its wings spread over her head. Perhaps you can see uh, the ram head of Amun here at her forehead. Um, and she seems to have tribal markings on her um, cheeks, and that will show up in a stela that I'm about to show you. But this queen is attested, she built everywhere. Um, so I will just show you on the map to the right, sort of the range of the areas that she built at. And just to get you situated, this is the third cataract here, the fourth cataract here, um, and the sixth cataract here. So um, reading from this list at the right, there are several blocks from Temple T that was built by her predecessor, the Napatan King Taharka uh, at Kawa in the north. Um, she also has a stela from um, the capital city of Meroe from the Amun Temple there. Um, her cartouches, so those circled royal names, are attested at Wad Banaka, um, where she has a palace uh, that was built for the queen and also a temple. This was just recently discovered with an image the excavators call of the deified queen. And I think that it's quite possible that it's Amani Shaketo herself who is uh, set up as a divine statue to be worshipped in this uh, temple at Wad Banaka. More on this uh, as the excavators uh, continue. Um, and then uh, Stila from Naka, um, which I will show you on the next slide, um, as well as another Stila. And this is just a big piece of stone that is has imagery and script on the front of it, like a, a billboard of the ancient world. So she was a prolific builder, this sole ruling queen, Amani Shaketo. And I'll just point out in this image here, you can see her name written in Meroitic hieroglyphs within a cartouche um, above her head there. So on the left is the stela from the Amun temple at Naka, there in the near vicinity of Meroe city. And on it, we see um, the queen being on the right, being embraced by the goddess, another indigenous goddess named Amasimi on the left. How do we know that? Uh, Meroitic hieroglyphs on the stela tell us. So this says Amani Shaketo Ko, meaning this is Amani Shaketo. Uh, and on behind the goddess, Amasimi Ko, this is Amasimi. Um, I'll just point out um, that the both the queen and the goddess have um, short afros. Uh, the goddess is wearing a diadem that features cowrie shells, which I said are really important in this culture associated with women. She has a very unique headdress that is a crescent moon with a falcon on top of it. And that falcon has the sun disc of the god Ray on top of him. So there's a lot going on here. Um, Amani Shaketo's um, royal burial at Meroe was looted by an Italian adventurer named Giuseppe Ferlini, um, who found a cache of about 250 pieces of uh, gold jewelry, some of which is depicted on the right of your screen. And these uh, bracelets that uh, is depicted here in the Lepsius from the Prussian expedition, this is the actual bracelet. So you see it's beautiful gold, a winged goddess depicted there with precious stones inlaid. Those have now ended up in two Egyptian museums, uh, Munich and in Berlin. So this is a depiction from the interior of the funerary chapel of Amani Shaketo. On the right, we see the queen wearing the typical Meroitic royal attire. She has the sash that goes over her right shoulder to the left. 
She's wearing these ball beads um, that you may have noticed on that unnamed queen that I showed you first. Uh, she also still has that short hair, the rearing cobra at her brow, um, all kinds of bracelets all the way up her arm. And I don't know if you can make out these fabulous long pointy uh, fingernails. And she is being revered and protected by a young man, probably a prince behind her, and then um, given incense to her nostrils by a prince in front of her. Uh, this is a similar depiction from the interior of the funerary chapel of Queen Nawidamak, who chose to be buried at that Northern Royal Cemetery at Napata, um, at the old uh, funerary grounds. Uh, we know that it's her because this is very rare um, for um, Nubian burials, but she's chosen also to have her name written in a cartouche here, in this case in Meroitic hieroglyphs. And then just in front of her um, is a, a young man who holds that title Pakara that I mentioned um, was held by Akinidad that seems to refer to um, the heir apparent, but um, that heir apparent also typically was governor for the northernmost uh, province uh, held within the Meroitic kingdom. Uh, on the left is just a sketch of a beautiful five-inch gold statue of Nawidamak that is held at the National Museum in Khartoum. We'll all just say a quiet prayer that it's still there uh, given the civil war happening in Sudan now. Um, so our final queen then is paired with a male ruler who had traditionally been understood as her husband, but now scholars are suggesting that he more likely was her son. So Amani Torre is shown on the right facade of the temple, mirroring the action uh, taken by Natakamani on the left. They both grasp prisoners by the hair as they prepare to um, dispatch them. Uh, and you can see lions under the um, king's feet mauling a prisoner while a lion is coming out from behind the queen uh, to maul the prisoners on her side. Um, and this is from the temple of Amun at that site called Naka, also in um, the area around Meroe City. Another uh, image from this uh, sacred site of Naka, um, this time from the temple of Apetamok. So you see his name there on the screen. He's the indigenous lion god uh, pictured on the left. And we see first uh, Natakamani uh, giving reverence to the god, then the um, Kandake Amani Tore, followed by a prince of which there are three uh, named uh, princes and so um, many offspring uh, to follow on the throne. I said I would talk a little bit about the ways that um, these Meroitic queens were understood in the New Testament. And this is um, the best example to use from um, the Acts of the Apostles, um, chapter eight, verses 26 to 41. Um, so I will just uh, read this out loud while noting that the Acts were probably written around 70 to 90 CE, so would have been written down after the time of this series of soul ruling queens, but the memory of um, this tradition in Meroe stays alive and is preserved in the Acts. And so uh, Luke, who to whom this um, uh, biblical book is attributed says, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake and they say, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. 
So there are several things uh, going on here um, in, in this excerpt from the Bible. There's clearly a memory of um, a powerful uh, queen who's ruling in Meroe, that she has immense wealth of gold, um, which is to be found in her lands. Um, and perhaps also an allusion to uh, the intense religiosity of these people that Greek authors uh, tell us about. Um, and of course, then artists love to depict uh, this scene. And so I've just pulled this particular um, scene here to share with you. Okay. Oops. Uh, so I'll just wrap up by saying that this tradition, this knowledge of these powerful ruling queens in um, ancient Meroe lives on today in Sudan. Um, so this piece of art I took off of the internet. I'm so sorry that I forgot to note down the artist, but I did note the title given to it, Embodying Tirhaka, Living Kandaka. And so they're making a reference to embodying this powerful Napatan king, Taharka, who ruled in Egypt during the 25th dynasty, and then also referring to um, the powerful Kandakas of the Meroitic period. And I just refer to this hashtag, keep eyes on Sudan, uh, because there is an atrocious uh, war going on there, including a genocide in Darfur, and the news media just is not reporting about it, but you can find more information on social media if you follow that hashtag, keep eyes on Sudan. So I just will um, finish by sharing this image that I love of a young then 22 year old University of Khartoum student named Allah Salah um, leading protesters uh, back in 2019 when a mass protest movement overthrew uh, the dictatorship of al-Bashir. And there was a brief moment uh, of glory and liberation for the Sudanese people. Um, but this woman is very intentionally embodying um, that powerful female spirit from ancient Meroe, and she was called the Kandaka of the revolution. So I will um, stop there and I'm really happy to take questions. Yeah, uh, so thank you. Yes, uh, there's a number of questions in the chat uh, already. And so um, we'll, uh, we'll move on to those. Uh, we've had a number of people asking the uh, similar kinds of questions. So uh, a group of questions centered around the language. If you could give us a little rundown of like you know, what the status of the language and the understanding of it is currently, what, what the history is. And then in particular, a lot of people are, are picking out this uh, Amani element in the names. And, and <laughs> do the names mean anything or does that particular element mean anything? Uh, yes, so, good yes. eye. Thank you. I meant to mention that. Um, so I'll just start talking about the Meroitic language. It is um, from a completely different language family than Egyptian. So we can't sort of extrapolate from our knowledge of ancient Egyptian to figure out the grammar of Meroitic because it belongs to a large African language family called Nilo-Saharan. Completely different the homeland of this entire language family is probably located exactly where genocide is taking place right now in Darfur. Um, so obviously we can't do linguistic research there and we've not been able to do so for decades because atrocities uh, continue in Darfur. Um, we, as I said, Griffith figured out how to decipher the script so we can sound out words. It is an alpha syllabary, uh, so it's quite different than the Egyptian writing system in that each symbol writes both a consonant and a following uh, vowel. So it's nice, it's easier. It's so much easier to learn. The grammar is what really kind of stumbles us. So we understand about a hundred words. It's sort of creeping up year by year, but the larger verbal system of this language is still um, 
really challenging. And I have a feeling that won't change until we start having Sudanese people, uh, Nubian people who are um, coming into the academy, uh, becoming Egyptologists, uh, Nubiologists, and they can bring their deep language knowledge to this study. Um, good eye catching that Amani. It is certainly um, prevalent in all of the royal names, and maybe you've already guessed why. This is how in Meroe you say the divine name Amun. So he was Yemen or Amun in Egypt, but it is pronounced Amani um, in Meroe. And what I meant to say on that slide where I was showing the three Kandakes um, and Amani Tore being embraced by Amun is that you'll notice that those three Kandakes all have Amani in their name that is probably making uh, reference to their connection with the god. I should also say, though, that male rulers do incorporate the name Amani as well. Nawida Mak's son was named Amani Kabale, for example. Along uh, similar lines, is that Strabo, we mentioned Kandaki, is that this same word? Uh, and, it is. Yeah. And just briefly, do you happen to know the reference where somebody could find that in Strabo because somebody asked about that? You can just Google Strabo Geographica 17.1.54 and it'll pop right up. There are multiple places where you can read it. And it's really great, fascinating reading. Um, and you can see that Strabo misunderstood the title as a personal name, right? He calls her Queen Candace. So he's thinking that that's her first name and not understanding that this is a royal title. But it may also indicate that she has both titles, the Kore and the Endaki title. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, in a different channel, <laughs> somebody asking about those uh, the pyramids, the one particular with the double pylon, I guess. Uh, can you give us an idea of how high that pyramid was or how high the gateways were? Yes, yes. So here's where I get to say that there are more pyramids in Sudan than in Egypt, and that is true. Um, the big caveat and difference is that those Pisa, uh, pyramids at Giza are mammoth, and these pyramids in Meroe are quite a bit smaller, although maybe they're, I don't know, I'm not really good with height, but maybe they're like... 40 or 50 feet tall they have a much steeper angle um and it is always the uh, form of burial that there is a pyramid above the burial and then coming out of the east side is a funerary chapel because many of the all of the important rites for the deceased had to be performed within this funerary chapel and so we found many offering tables um, that would have been set up inside the funerary chapel so that um, mourners could have come to pour out uh, a libation of uh, water, milk, or wine over the offering table and left um, bread and vegetables, all of the things that we see depicted um, in ancient Egyptian funerary depictions. And uh, that you the burials do not happen with inside the the pyramid itself, that they were under put underneath in the ground and then the pyramid built directly on top of it with no connection from the burial chamber to the pyramid itself. So it was if uh, 40 feet is like a, a four three or four story apartment building or something like that. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to stick with that. I'm not good at this. <laughs> uh, did, the, did the rulers uh, take an active role in building their funerary temples? Did, did they have a uh, hand in designing them? Or can they I'm going to imagine. I'm going to imagine so, because they really differ. I said that there are about 64 um, royal burials in this Beggar Awiya North, the most important royal cemetery. And the decoration, the number of burial chambers varies, the um, um, funerary goods that these rulers were buried with really changes over time. And then the depictions within 
the inner walls of the funerary chapels also really reveal what was important uh, to that particular ruler and probably the priest who were the intellectuals of the court at that time who would have advised the ruler about which text to use, what type of scenes to use. Um, yeah, but they do change over time. Uh, slightly related to that is that with the Victory Temple, the, the, the peoples other than the king-like or queen-like figures, uh, do we know anything about who, who they are, the peoples, the other people represented in this? Yeah, yeah, there's very clearly um, a European person there on the right hand side and folks have said that he's wearing some type of military garb on his top. Is it called a cuirass? I'm not exactly sure. But um, Roman scholars have recognized like the attire worn by that fellow who has yellow hair, right? This is not a fellow African that they are um, conquering here. Um, there on the left hand side, there's somebody who has a feather in his hair who might be representative of a Libyan, so from the Western desert. Um, and then they're also clearly showing that they are conquering and dominating their neighbors within the area of Nubia. So it really is um, probably realistic in depicting the various groups that they're engaging in battle with, but also trying to make a statement about how universal the domination of these rulers is. Is there evidence of other uh, females in leading roles, particularly in the military? Uh, or was the queen just giving orders and, and soldiers were doing the? I'm not aware. That's actually a good question. And I've never gotten that before. I am not aware of female warriors aside from the queen who's sort of leading the charge, but um, that's such a great question and something worth looking into. I can't name a, a specific one. And the only way I think we would know is by um, somebody being buried by weapons. They don't, like in Egypt, have these extensive tomb biographies where they say um, their life and who their parents were and their whole history. So we're a little bit, um, we have less information um, in Nubia, unfortunately. Uh, what, what's the relationship of, of Isis to Meroe? Is, is she an Egyptian god they brought in, or is she uh, somebody that's taken by the Egyptians and, and moves on to Rome and other places? Um, I would say that she's originally an Egyptian goddess, and I'm going to be the first person to want to claim Nubian origin for anything that I can. But she, Isis already appears in the pyramid text, so that's like 2500 BCE. Um, it's quite old. Um, and we see, though, in the period that I studied, the Roman period at the Temple of Philae, they are coming very specifically to this temple that's depicted behind me, actually, to um, give reverence to the goddess Isis. And so there's a strong interest in Isis uh, in all of her many forms, but maybe specifically as a, a goddess who uh, performs rites for her slain husband, Osiris. Um, she is adopted and depicted in temples um, down by Meroe, but there she has a bit more of a martial aspect. Um, I'm just going to say she's an Egyptian goddess, but they really, truly did love her in Nubia. Is there any other uh, Meroean goddesses who, who make it to the big time and, and do go into the like, Greco-Roman world or uh, anything of that sort? Ah, no, like we don't see that Amasimi, who I was showing with the Mani Shaketo on the stela, we don't see her outside of Nubia even. We don't see her represented in Egyptian temples, for example. We do see that Sebiu Mekker that I showed you on the little Aegis. Um, he does appear um, in the Temple of Philae, at least his reference to his name, um, and there are small little shrines along the forecourt at Philae to Nubian and Meroitic gods, but that seems to be sort of the border. They don't really go north of that into Egypt and certainly not to Greece. Although the Greeks tell us a lot about an interest in visiting Meroe and a reverence for the antiquity 
of the culture and the um, the piety of the people. So um, I'm thinking of like the first Greek novel called the Aethiopica, which is such a kind of a crazy fantasy about a priestess at Delphi who, who has this dream or an urge to go travel to Egypt and makes her way to Meroe only to find out that she's a Meroitic royal woman, uh, long lost. And so it's the Greeks are very much interested in this early period in connecting themselves to the antiquity and the sanctity of Meroe. All right. Well, uh, it looks like we are pretty much out of time. So rather than risking being cut off in the middle of an answer, we'll just uh, call it a night. But uh, there's been a lot of questions I haven't been able to get to. Uh, so we've created a lot of interest. Anybody interested, read the book, uh, Calling Out to ISIS, and you'll get further insight. And you're given another talk in April. Is that right? Do you know any further details? Um, I believe it is on April 24th. Um, it will be in, I'll be in person in Walla Walla, Washington. I don't know if they're planning to um, record or have an online component. I'm not sure about that, but I'm, I'm looking forward to going there. I will be talking more specifically about um, how, who were the precise contemporaries in Meroe to the Egyptian Queen Cleopatra. Well, this has been a joy, you know, keep opening the door to this place that the Romans did their best to sweep under the rug. It, it was the Gustavus who got swept under the rug. <laughs> <and stuff>. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again. And uh, best of luck to you and everything. My pleasure. Thank you all. All right.